Good afternoon. Welcome to the latest webinar by MBF Bioscience. I'm Sue Tappan, staff scientist here at MBF. I also run the day-to-day -day operations at our contract stereology research facility, MBF Labs. Today we're doing something completely different, a live question and answer show. So this webinar is dictated by the questions you ask either at the time that you registered or during the next hour or so. I'll do my best to answer as many of them on the fly as I can. We've had a wonderful response to this webinar. You're logged on with over 134 fellow stereology enthusiasts, so I'm sure this will be a lively discussion. So let's get started. Our first question is from Eva, and she submitted this prior to the webinar, and she wants to know for the for the nucleator, how many isotropic uniform random sections and nuclei do you need to include for your estimate? So it just so happens I have a slide or two that can uh, address this very question. So the nucleator is a way to estimate cell volume and it's best for thick systematic random sample sections. Um, we're achieving isotropy by using uh, a combination of the probe and the tissue must be isotropic and we're going to be able to obtain cross-sectional area or cell volume. Um, you combine this probe with the optical fractionator. That's an excellent way to, to do this probe. And when you um, set up the nucleator, you can set it up to aim for approximately four radii per object. Um, that tends to be a good middle ground between doing enough work per cell um, and um, balancing how many cells you need to estimate. Uh, to actually throw the rays for the nucleator, you'll click anywhere inside the cell and um, click where the probe radii um, intersect with the boundary you're interested in. You can set an interval if you want. So if you're doing this with the optical fractionator and you are anticipating that you will obtain, let's say, 800 cells um, through counting with the optical fractionator, you could set an interval with your nucleator so that the rays only show up on, on every fourth cell. That would obtain approximately 200 cells for your nucleator estimation, and that would be, that would be a good safe amount. Uh, between 100 and 150 cells is um, recommended per population per animal. You can um, simultaneously measure multiple components of the cell. So for example, if you wanted to measure the size of the nucleus and the size of the soma, you would just place um, a second round of um, points where the boundary intersects for the soma as well as for the nucleus. It's important when you're doing a probe like the nucleator to, to really take this do more, less well tip to heart. Um, when you have an irregularly shaped object, remember that the nucleator is meant to provide an estimate of the population. And so the actual size of any one given object at a single plane of section, optical section, is less important than how many estimates of how many cells you obtain. And so it doesn't really help you out to spend a lot of time measuring any individual cell. Instead, use four radii and just do it on 100 to 150 cells or more per population per animal. So that's our first question. Let's move on to another one. Okay. So we have a system setup question. This is from Barbara. And Barbara wants to know, she says, I have a BioQuant system, but I'm interested in your software as an alternative. I do not have a microscope with a motorized stage, so please cover whether and how I could use Stereo Investigator with my current microscope. Um, so, It's important to understand specifically what's required from a system setup basis for efficient and accurate stereologic sampling. Um, a typical system contains a microscope with a motorized XY stage 
along with um, a motorized focus or manual focus, but it contains a Z encoder. Um, that is connected to a computer. You also have a, a digital camera which provides a live feed through the microscope to the monitor and you, your microscope is set up with multiple objectives. If you do not have a motorized stage, you're really severely limited in what you can do stereologically because control of the motorized stage is essential for that random part of systematic random sampling. If you do not have software control, but you do have access to a motorized microscope, you can do a number of um, stereology probes so long as you have the entire region captured, as I recommend, a seamless montage, either 2D or 3D, depending on which probe you're using. And then you can use um, a stereo investigator workstation version in order to collect some data. But without a motorized stage, I think you're unfortunately pretty limited. Um, we can provide a, a way to provide you with a motorized stage that, um, because we work with many, many systems, uh, Zeiss, Leica, Olympus, Nikon, and um, the systems that we can control are, are many. And so we can work with the equipment that you do have. Okay, so moving on to the next question. This is from Ellen. Ellen asks, my colleague Dan Zadori and I were wondering if the optical fractionator is immune to differential shrinkage. Um, okay. Okay, so um, for number estimation, which is what you're doing with the optical fractionator probe, remember that shrinkage does not actually change the number of the objects in your region of interest. So um, this, uh, these figures are from uh, the Dorf, Peterson, Nyingard, and Gunderson paper from 2001. It's an excellent read. I recommend that you, you uh, take a look at it. It's a very clear description of how um, differential shrinkage can uh, impact um, the estimation of various parameters. Number is immune to differential shrinkage because the number of, for example, penguins here does not change regardless of the size of the iceberg that they're sitting on. You can um, account for differential shrinkage where, depending on the height of your dissector, um, you would have a different height sampling fraction that is calculated. And that's all based on the average measured mounted thickness. And so if you measure at every site, consider using the number weighted section thickness estimate. And this would be my recommendation for what, to, what estimate to report when you have a case of differential shrinkage. Um, if you do have this situation going on with your histology, you may be able to um, make your histology a bit more regular with some subtle changes to how you actually are collecting your tissue. And so there's always that opportunity to try to improve your histology over time. Okay, here's a question that takes us to Stereo Investigator. Maria asks, how can I use the Cavalieri estimate to estimate whole volume in subsequent big coronal sections of the human brain? So let's go to Stereo Investigator and I'll show you one way to do it. So in Stereo Investigator, um, when you have a series of coronal sections or any sections that you want to estimate uh, the volume on where you're not also um, performing other other um, other estimates. Uh, the fastest and easiest way to do this is to throw a grid and place the points manually. And so the first thing that you would do is set up your serial section manager. And here you would enter in the number of sections that you have to evaluate, the distance between them, the interval between them. So you could be estimating every fifth section and let's say the mounted thickness is 250 microns. Oops, not mounted thickness, excuse me, the cut thickness. There we go. 
Okay, so now we've got five sections here. And if you have um, images like I have available to me, I'm going to bring in a human brain image, like so. And now I'm going to throw the Cavalieri probe. I'm going to launch the Cavalieri, and I'm going to determine the spacing so that I get 10 to 15 points per section with 10 to 15 sections through my region of interest. And, um, and then you would mark the points. One nice thing, once you select a marker, that um, happens is that in, Cav in Cavalieri Estimator, the snapped grid mode is already enabled. And so you just have to be in the vicinity in order for the point to get marked. And so what I like to do is do all the easy ones first, where all the point, the whole um, grid marker is entirely contained within the section. And then I can change resolutions and take a closer look at the Cavalieri point to determine whether or not I should mark it. You need to choose which quadrant of the grid point that you're going to use to determine whether or not to include the point in your estimate. I prefer to use the lower right just because. And you can see that if you're approaching the grid point here from the lower right, it does not exist over the section, so I would not mark it. So I'm going to zoom out and go to my next point. And so this one is contained completely within. And this one is also because as I come, as I approach this point from the lower right hand quadrant, you can see that there's tissue underneath it, so I mark it. You can see that my circular cursor is nice and big. If I wanted to switch, I can go into paint mode, paint Cavalieri markers mode, which will allow me to quickly and easily place multiple points by holding down the left mouse button. And so if I zoom out again, I'm just going to make sure that I didn't miss any points that I need to evaluate. And here's one that I need to make a decision on. That's clearly in. Snapping back. Let's take a look at this guy. Okay. So this is the this is the process for performing Cavalieri, regardless of the size of the section that you're actually evaluating, or whether or not you're doing it live or from an image. When you have completed work on the first section, um, it's just as simple as switching sections and moving to the next location, either by bringing in the next image or moving the stage so that you're viewing the next section under, under view in order to place the points. So um, the Cavalieri Estimator is a very efficient way to calculate area and volume in your region of interest. Okay, so having tackled the Cavalieri, let's see what other questions we have. Jorge just asked how to estimate the total number of fibers in a determined brain region. So the typical way to quantify the um, fibers in a brain region is actually less about the number of fibers and more about their total length. And the um, method that is typically represented is um, space balls. So space balls allows you to have um, your tissue preparation in a preferred orientation, isotropic or vertically sectioned, so long as it's thick. Um, length estimations are not immune to shrinkage, and so you want to make sure that you prepare your tissue so that um, shrinkage is minimized as much as possible. For space balls, you achieve isotropy via the probe, and you'll get a total length for the number of fibers um, in your region of interest. And so if we take a look at what happens here, we have an image volume, and you can see that there are multiple um, processes coursing through this uh, image stack. As we focus up and down, you can see that the fibers um, come in and out of plane of focus. The space balls is a virtual probe that is placed in the center of the section, or in the session, and you're going to have multiple 
um, space balls throughout your region of interest. And as you focus through the tissue, you're going to mark any intersection where the probe pierces the fiber of interest. And so here you can see that these points were all marked as they intersect with the probe. And you would continue this for the number of probes determined by your area sampling fraction and the size of your probe across multiple sections in order to obtain a total length estimate for your region of interest. So say the number of dopaminergic fiber or the length of dopaminergic fibers in the sub in the striatum would be a typical application for space balls. Okay, so we have a related question from Corinne. She says, okay, well, what if it's not fibers? What if it's blood vessels? How do you estimate blood vessel density in a region of the brain? So in this case, again, you're going to want to take advantage of the space ball probe. It's the most um, easy to use length estimation probe, um, mainly because it's very straightforward to, to perform because the isotropy is obtained through the probe itself. And so you're going to prepare your thick sections and when you're estimating blood vessel length um, because they have a greater width, you will um, imagine a center line coursing through the blood vessel and that's what you're going to use to um, determine when the probe pierces um, the blood vessel. You could also classify the blood vessels if you wanted to, capillary versus um, arterial or venule, if you were interested, and just by using different markers, and then you would get length estimates with a classification, which could be of interest. If you wanted to then relate that length to a length density, um, you can estimate the volume of the region of interest using Cavalieri. So you would combine the two probes, space walls for length estimation, Cavalieri for volume estimation, divide the two and you get a length density. Broadly speaking, we often get a lot of questions about tissue preparation. Um, and it's great that you ask these questions because stereology, it's so important that you consider a priori how you're going to prepare your tissue before you do so. Um, because so much of what you're able to do for a probe relies on how they're prepared. And so, just as an example, we just talked about space balls, which is an isotropic probe, which means you can use um, preferentially cut sections, but it also requires that you have thick sections. So, it's, we're commonly asked, what do you mean by thick? My stock answer is as thick as you can make it, where you can have the tissue uh, visualization method, so your staining protocol, that penetrates your entire section thickness. So when you're preparing your tissue, first you need to, you need to think about how you're going to recognize your region of interest for delineation as well as the object that you want to quantify. So I have here cell population of interest, but it could also be blood vessel or, or um, fibrotic um, uh, extracellular matrix like collagen or something like that. Uh, and you want to balance that section cut thickness with the staining protocol along with the requirements of the stereologic probe. Um, and knowing what's necessary for the probe dictates um, how much optimization of the histology protocol you should, you should do. Um, a lot of, you know, some front end work on optimizing your histology will pay dividends later on. So for thick SRS probes like the optical fractionator or um, space balls, for example, we would um, prefer sections thicknesses greater than 20 microns after processing. So that's what it shrunk to, not what you cut it at. And especially for length pr estimation probes, you want to make sure that you minimize your shrinkage as much as possible. Because remember, if you can't see it, you can't count it. So you need to make sure that um, each object has an equal opportunity of being counted once and only once. And so you need to make sure your histology is appropriate for not only the probe you want to do and the question you want to answer, but also the, the, the section staining method that you're looking at. So when we talk about shrinkage, 
um, that post-processing section thickness is, is used in the estimate calculation, so it's really important. And you want to retain as much of the tissue thickness as possible. To do this, you can usually modify your protocol very minimally and, and reap great dividends in terms of um, what you get for section thickness. The most important thing that I found that makes a big difference is minimizing your exposure to air. So those times in your protocol that aren't written down where you um, mount your sections and then go to lunch and then resume by placing your sections in wash and then going to block is one example. Um, limit that as much as possible. How long do the sections um, sit on the slide while you're cutting the tissue? Pay attention to that and you can obtain uh, section thicknesses that are much closer to what you cut it at than what um, you would obtain otherwise. Other things you, that you can do is uh, limit the exposure to alcohol. Uh, you don't necessarily need to cut it out, but you can be mindful about how long you actually need to have it sit in alcohol in order for you to obtain the, the staining clarity that you need. Um, you might consider fluorescent staining instead. Can you, um, because the fluorescent staining tends to be less drying or less harsh on the tissue, so you get better preservation of the thickness. Finally, a quick and easy way is first see what you get without um, uh, transitioning your tissue after staining through dehydration steps so that you can cover slip with DPX. Try, try an aqueous mounting medium instead. That might work beautifully. And then the only thing you're changing is how you're mounting, mounting the tissue. Okay, so I'm going to move on to another question. Oh, this is interesting actually. Um, we got a couple of questions coming in from this um, regarding the spinal cord, um, and here's one. This one is from Rahul, and would like to know how do you estimate the number of motor neurons in a spinal cord segment? Uh, the best way, in my opinion, to estimate the total number of motor neurons in the spinal cord segment would be to use the optical fractionator method. And the trickiness comes in, how do you know when you're in one segment versus the other? So it might be rather straightforward to know when you're in the lumbar regions because of um, the lower limbs coming out and the ventral horn gets really big. But um, you need to use your knowledge of anatomy in order to determine the accurate boundaries, not only of your region of interest, the ventral horn, but also when the ventral horn is within the segment that you care about. So that's the tricky part, I think, about adapt, you know, using the optical fractionator in the spinal cord is knowing when and where to look and when to stop looking. Um, motor neurons also, so if you're looking at alpha motor neurons, um, in the literature people have determined um, the difference between a motor neuron and an alpha motor neuron, for example, or an average neuron in the, in the ventral horn by uh, using a size criteria. And so in that case, you could um, just make sure that your criteria contains not just the unique point on the neuron, but the neuron has to be greater than a certain size in order for it to be included in your estimate. Um, so other than that, you don't need to consider anything special um, to count the number of motor neurons in the spinal cord. You just need to be able to determine the boundaries of the segment how you're going to identify your motor neuron of choice, um, and you might want to consider um, a size constraint, constraint, for example, and then make sure that your staining is optimized for the optical fractionator probe. Nice thick tissue where the t um, staining penetrates the entire thickness. Along the same lines of, let's stick with um, number estimation for just a little bit longer. And this time, let's deal with what you need to consider if you want to do fluorescent staining instead. So fluorescence um, staining has some great benefits. You tend to preserve much of the section thickness that you have. You have great optical clarity, and you have the ability to um, easily distinguish multiple um, proteins, um, rather, over um, bright field staining. So you have a lot of benefits. When you want to combine that with confocal um, illumination, um, 
Stereo Investigator has modules that can control your confocal um, microscope so that you obtain systematic random sampling through your region of interest and then um, the individual confocal stacks are acquired. Once acquired, then you would count them in, um, in a normal um, optical fractionator method. So, okay, and so what you would do is you would use um, a workflow to guide your stack acquisition. So we've got systematic random sampling to allow you to acquire those image stacks because when you have a confocal, you need to acquire each image of each protein at each Z level and then merge those images together in order to, to count typically because you're interested in either multiple objects or sometimes um, the congruence of multiple stains is what's necessary for you to determine whether or not you should mark that object. For example, if you were interested in astrocytes, you would want to consider not only staining your tissue for GFAP, but also um, using a, a nissel stain like DAPI so that you can use the nucleus as your unique point for counting those. So um, the workflow will stream, streamline the process of figuring out all of the acquisition parameters and then you can um, count offline using the optical fractionator method. And so in this case you would still use the same standard rules that you do if you were counting live, but now you're using image stacks that were acquired in a systematic and random way. Oh, okay, so there's a follow-up question to that. The question is, okay, so you're doing the optical fractionator on confocal stacks. stacks. Do you have to have the confocal microscope linked live to Stereo Investigator in order to obtain SRS samples, or can you do it separately and then import the images to SI for optical fractionator counts? The answer is, you could do it both ways. You could um, set it up so that Stereo Investigator controls your confocal microscope to do systematic random sampling, and at each site the stack is acquired, and then um, as it's acquired, it's shipped back to Stereo Investigator for you to count it, or you could just save that stack, move on to acquire the next stack, and so on, and then count offline, so non-live. Um, it's, it's up to you how you'd like to work that. Brian has a question about what is the best way to determine the optimal magnification for images for stereology? This is a great question. It all depends on what you're trying to quantify. If, for example, you are looking to estimate cerebral volume, you could acquire images at a very low magnification because the criteria that you need is, is it in the brain or not? If you're looking to perform stereology on a very sparse population, um, like these uh, retinal ganglion cells um, in the retina, you can determine your sampling parameters and your magnification so that you can adequately see your object of interest um, and size your counting frame so that you're, you're counting zero to five objects through your region of interest. Of note is that the, the retina is considered a, a planar structure. You know, it doesn't have much depth to it, if any, so um, uh, you would use the fractionator for counting um, the retina, for example, whereas for the optical fractionator, the magnification lens actually plays a big, uh, a big deal. So let's go look at that in detail. Okay, so we already covered um, the equipment necessary. So let's talk about the importance of the objective lens. So when you're counting um, or, or using estimating objects in um, three dimensions, the objective lens is critically important. You're going to want a high numerical aperture objective lens, and if you're using bright field, you want to make sure you perform color illumination. The reason for the high resolution in that thin depth of field, which is determined by the numerical aperture, it aids in the ability to discriminate between objects that are close to each other in Z. So in this example, if you have a low, low NA lens where you've got a large depth of field, this means that objects that are within 5.8 microns of each other all look to be at the same Z. 
And so you can't discriminate that there are actually three objects here because all you basically see is these stacked up on top of each other. As you increase the numerical aperture of your objective, that depth of field gets lower and lower. And so now as you focus through the tissue, um, smaller and smaller aspects of that optical depth are come into focus. And so you could easily focus through the tissue and see when these cells come into focus for the first time, allowing you to see three cells here, not one. I made um, a quick slide of just what it looks like um, at 20x and 100x. Uh, my screenshots are a little pixelated, but pretend they're not. <laughs> so this is new end um, staining in the striatum, and this is what it looks at looks like at 20x. So you can see the striosomes, and you can see the density of of these neuro medium spiny neurons here in the striatum. If you were to try to count this with the optical fractionator, you would basically see a bunch of um, cells all coming into focus all at the same time. So you wouldn't be able to see any cells that are on top of each other. Now, if instead the view changes dramatically once you have a higher numerical aperture, so looking at that same tissue at 100x, you are able to discriminate the cell tops, so these unique points for these objects that you're going to include in your estimate because the depth of field is much finer. And so when you're choosing um, the magnification that's necessary for stereology, it's important to consider what probe you're using, what object you're looking to discriminate, as well as um, how densely packed they are. Regina wants to know if we're going to be at SFN this year, and the answer is yes. Please stop by. Okay. The question is, are both top and bottom guard zones needed? Sometimes if both are used, the section thickness will be too thin and is hard to count. Is that okay to use only one zone, for example, the top zone? Um, the short answer is your, the accuracy of your estimate is going to be impacted by that type of error. So I would recommend that you size the dissector and the top and bottom guard zone to fit within the minimum measured section thickness in your tissue. Let's see if I have a slide. Mm -hmm. So these are the counting rules. Okay, here we go. And so um, you want to determine the appropriate guard zones here. And you can empirically determine that um, by setting up your pilot study to um, count without guard zones so that you can see how much tissue deformation as well as variation in section thickness you have um, for your particular staining run that you're looking to quantify. Um, and you want to size it so that you do have guard zones at the top and bottom because due to interactions with the knife blade you can have what are called lost caps or um, plucked cells where the cells that should have been in the tissue are lost, um, and in that case, your estimate is impacted um, because the cells, the the estimate should be restricted to an area that is not damaged, so that each cell where you're looking has an equal opportunity to be counted once and only once. Getting to the question of section thickness, so again, that has an impact not only with how you're um, setting up your dissector, but also um, um, what you can see when you're counting. And this question has come in. So for 20 microns, which is what I say is a good, good thickness to shoot for, for the post-processing thickness, um, for neuronal cells, but not other cells with a smaller volume, the size of the object that you're quantifying does impact um, what thickness you need um, for your tissue. The thicker the tissue where the tissue or the, where the staining penetrates your entire section thickness, the more efficient you'll be and the faster you'll obtain your unbiased estimate. The reasoning for that is that it's faster to focus up and down through a larger height sampling fraction, so a larger dissector height than it is to do that on more sites per section or more sites per section on more sections. 
And so as you're calculating your volume fraction, if you can devote more of your volume fraction to the height sampling fraction, you are going to be more efficient. So thicker is always better, even if you are counting something as tiny as inclusion bodies or synapses. Um, if you are counting something that is um, submicron like synapses or inclusion bodies, you do not need um, such thick tissue, but what you are aiming for is this ability to see very clearly when the object first comes into focus for the very first time so that you can make a determination of whether or not it's in your dissector. Pavan wants to know, when using the optical fractionator, do you recommend using the highest possible magnification for counting? Generally, yes. Um, that is, in general, what I recommend. There's a couple of questions about pilot studies. I saw them earlier. Let me see if I can find them again. So how to determine your optimum sampling. So we can spend a little bit of time talking about that because there's a few questions that have come in um, that deal with this topic. And this one, this question is posed by Hong. And uh, the question is, does Stereo Investigator have a function to allow you to estimate the optimum number of cells needed per counting frame and the number of sampling sites to avoid over or under sampling? And the short answer is yes. So let's go over um, what to think about when you're determining your sampling parameters, and then we can talk about how um, you can subsample your data to figure out what the optimum sampling parameters are for your particular um, area of interest. So what I highly recommend is that you evaluate the current literature and use that as a guide for your pilot study. Um, Especially when evaluating the current literature, pay attention to what type of method was used. Is If they used stereology, did they use the right probe? If they did use the right probe, did they use the right magnification? And what parameters did they provide? Additionally, you can design your own scheme empirically. And so in this case, if you're starting from scratch, you can determine the size of your region of interest, so use an atlas, to determine how many sections you'll have with your desired cut thickness. From that, you can calculate your desired section sampling size. Based on the size of your object of interest, you'll determine your counting frame. So size and distribution, frequency. So in that case, the more cells you have, um, the smaller you want your counting frame to be. Um, you want to size your counting frame to fit 0 to 5 objects so that you are efficient and um, less prone to error. It's easy to lose track of where you're looking if your counting frame is too big and there are too many cells in it. You want to determine your post-processing section thickness and during your pilot study you want to make sure you measure at every site to determine the variability both within and between sections. You may find, for example, that you have nice thick sections on the last section on your slide and for some strange reason that first section on your slide is thinner. That could be how, based on how you acquired the tissue. So if you're cutting cryostat, for example, and you're thaw mounting, it may have taken you a while to get from the section one to the last section, you know, the first section to the last section, so section one had more exposure to air than the last section. So it's good to measure at every site and to take a look at it after. And then you're going to determine the number of sampling sites. And you're going to test the validity of the sampling using a parameter determination study. So again, just to rehash this, you have your entire region of interest, and then you're going to divvy it up into uh, physical sections. And then within each section, you're going to determine how many counting sites um, will be on average in your region of interest. And then um, you'll determine the dissector height. So those are the the three components of the volume fraction. You have the section sampling fraction, so how many sections you look at, the area sampling fraction, which is what percentage of the section's area did you visit, and then the height sampling fraction, which is the ratio of the dissector height to the average measured section thickness. So to oversample one animal from each group, um, this is a great way to do a parameter determination study. You'll want to choose conservative sampling parameters for the number of sections and the number of sites visited. You're going to optimize your counting frame based on the frequency and the size of your objects of interest. Um, and that's zero to five objects through the thickness of the tissue. You're going to sample your entire section thickness. 
Um, this will allow you to determine what the optimum guard zones are for your region, tissue preparation, and your region. And so you'd set the guard zone to zero and a dissector height equal to the section cut thickness. In order to do this type of operation, you need to measure the section thickness at every site. And then you'll count your objects using standard rules for the dissector. Once you have created this data file where you're on purpose counting too much so that you can determine how much less work you can do for the remaining animals in your study, make sure you save a separate copy of your data file. You're going to look at the histogram and the counts by site. You'll be able to then perform dissector resampling. This will allow you to determine the optimum guard zone height as well as the dissector height. And then you can do area and section sampling, uh, resampling to determine if those parameters can be adjusted as well. So this is uh, a rehash a little bit. So for the section sampling fraction, figure out what the appropriate number, and again that, that varies for your region of interest, and then decrease the interval so that you have you know, two or three times more sections. Again, you're only going to do this on one animal per group, so it's a little bit more work for, for your pilot study, but then hopefully not only will you have greater confidence that these are appropriate parameters for your full study, but um, you'll be able to see if you can do less work for the remaining animals. For oversampling for the height sampling fraction, again, you're going to combine this with these other oversampling routines for the section sampling fraction and the area sampling fraction. And this data file can be used, but it can't be used as a population estimate until it has been resampled to include guard zones. Right now, this data file was counted with a guard zone set to zero. You don't have to count this animal again, but this data needs to be resampled in order to only keep data in the dissector height that you want. And so after looking at the data, you'll figure out what you want and then apply it to this, this data. And then the area sampling fraction is generally where I found, apart from the height sampling fraction, to gain the most uh, utility. Okay, so when you look at um, your z-depth frequency histogram, to determine the appropriate guard zone, what I do is I look for the average um, distribution of the cells within the section thickness. And then at the top of the section, which is um, near this zero, zero point here, so this zero is top of section, you can see that there's much, many fewer tops of cells there. And that has to do with these cells being cut into pieces and or plucked. And so you'll want to make sure that your guard zone limits where the dissector starts so that it's in the depth of the tissue that hasn't been damaged. When you subsample, subsample, you'll generate multiple estimates, and you can look at how the estimates vary um, to determine where you should sample. And so here's an example of what an area sampling fraction resample looks like. And so using all of the data, so um, every counting site is included in the estimate, you get a single estimate. If instead you take every other counting site, and then create an estimate from the evens and the odds, you'll get two estimates. Three, every fourth, every fifth, and so on, all the way out to every twentieth. And what you can do then is basically walk to the right to determine at which point you feel comfortable doing less work. So then you would calculate um, an area, or a grid size, that is equivalent to visiting every sixth site. This is described in a paper by Slomianka and West, and I highly recommend that you take a look at it. It's a great read. So while we're talking about this dissector resampling here, what can I do to determine how much my tissue is shrinking after processing? There's um, a few ways you can empirically determine this, and the best way that I know how to do this is during your pilot study. So if you measure at every site, when you are performing your study, you'll calculate at each place that you look at the top and the bottom of your section, and that will give you the average or the, the thickness at that site. As you do that for every site that you're counting, you're going to get a very good picture of how much, what the difference is between what you cut the tissue at and what it shrank to. Remember that the estimate is calculated on what it shrank to, so your average measured post-processing section thickness. So this value is actually really important. If you have differential shrinkage, remember you can use the number-weighted section thickness estimate. 
So back to um, sampling design. You count different brain regions in mice and these regions overlap um, in the orientation that you're looking at the tissue. How can you determine an interval for the tissue sections? Again, remember that the interval that you need for your region of interest is determined not only by the size of the region, but also the frequency and distribution of your objects within that region. Um, that'll depend on the shape of your region. So if, if, if it's uniform in shape, um, you can require fewer sections. If it's more non-uniform, you'll need more. Depending on how frequent your objects are, you can also require less sections than if um, you have a sparse population. Um, depending on how the objects are distributed in your region of interest will also determine the section interval that you need to choose. So if they're unevenly distributed like this glass on the right, you need to actually sample more in order to pick up this, this change in the, the number of objects. In this case they're oriented towards the bottom of the cup, but you may have a situation where the cells in your lesion situation die caudally first and then as the, the lesion expands or the insult expands over time then you see the effect rostrally too. And so you need to know a lot about your question not just for an individual region of interest but when you're using um, the same brain to estimate parameters in multiple brain regions you have to take all of this into account when you're determining your section sampling fraction. So. The short answer is determine your minimum section interval. So let's say that's um, one and two through your uh, through your small region, like like the amygdala, and um, that coexists in the same sections with the striatum, which is very large. And so what you may need to do for the striatum, you wouldn't want to count every other section through the striatum. That's just too much work. And so what you may do is pick an, a multiple of two for your interval through the striatum. So a one in four or a one in six or a one in eight through your striatum based on, on what you see. So just keep the multiples um, to the least common denominator and, and you should be okay. But it does require a bit of planning in order to execute that. Well, this, this is a really active area of interest. And it's how can we define microglia activation using stereology other than cell count? This is related to that question that was asked about motor neurons, where you may be interested in not all of the neurons in the ventral horn, but rather only the alpha motor neurons, so the big guys. So you may only be interested in these, these guys that are gigantic. Um, in microglia, as um, they undergo a conformational change when dependent upon the state that they're in, and so this activation, they go from a ramified, you know, large exploratory um, view. These are astrocytes, but um, microglia kind of look like this also, where they've, they're nice and broad. And then um, when they're activated, uh, you'll find that they're very compact. And so if you wanted to uh, keep track of both populations, you would need to come up with clear criteria to determine when a microglia is activated um, based on its shape or maybe a protein um, that is present, like uh, I think it's CD68, tends to define activation in some subpopulations of microglial cells. Um, and then you would use sort of a ubiquitous microglial uh, marker like IBA1 as a way to identify the microglia themselves. And so you would just use two markers, count them sim simultaneously using one marker for the activated and one for the quiescent or resting state. And you could um, look to start to identify the differences in the population. Okay, so there's a question about estimating damaged volume like an infarct um, and the optical magnification. Let's see. Okay, so this might be our last question. So when you are interested in estimating um, a component volume, so how much of the hippocampus 
is occupied by an infarct, or in this case, this, this shows plaques, um, you should use um, the area fraction fractionator. It's a very efficient probe because it is a planar probe. It's a 2D probe, and you can choose the optical magnification that allows you to effectively see the difference between your two um, objects. So if you've got a very large infarct, then you can use a low magnification objective. If you've got um, lots of tiny infarcts, like say like this plaque load here, then you would want to make sure that you're viewing the tissue at a magnification that allows you to discriminate when it is damaged and when it's not. Using the area fraction fractionator is very straightforward, it's very easy to perform, and um, that will allow you to calculate not only the volume of the infarct, but also the volume of the region that you're interested in. All right, I'll just, I'll just get back to Ellen. Ellen asked one of these questions at the very beginning, and we'll just come full circle. She asks, could we clarify our question from earlier regarding differential tissue shrinkage? Differential shrinkage meaning when particle densities are not uniform through the section. Okay, so that's not shrinkage. You know, actually, I'm not entirely sure what you mean by that, because when you employ the optical fractionator, you are going to mark the particles when they appear for the first time within your dissector through your section thickness. And so it, it actually does not matter where they are in the section thickness so long as where you're estimating is representative of the tissue as a whole. And so that's why we use guard zones to ensure that you're only counting where the tissue is, is not previously damaged. So even in this instance, you don't need to do anything special if I understand your question correctly, which is the optical fractionator is not impacted by differential tissue shrinkage or by um, non-uniform distribution of your particles. If that's the case, then you just want to make sure that your sampling design is set up so that you can see this distribution difference um, throughout your region and then your estimate is going to be accurate. Okay, I'm going to close with this um, last question by Regina, and she wants to know if MBF is developing techniques to allow um, stereology on really thick sections such as the clarity method. We are very excited about the clarity method, and um, based on the forums that I've been looking at, everybody else is too. So I think that that represents a really amazing development in the field if we can really harness its power. Because so much of what we talked about, even in this last question, deals with what happens when you cut the tissue. So if you can use the tissue without sectioning it, so just optically sectioning it all the way through using this clarity method, then the methods for stereology are just going to be so much easier. There's just going to be less error and improved data. The challenge comes with that is an immense amount of data that you're going to be generating. And uh, we are ready to tackle that, that question. Um, we already know that we are able to handle very, very thick, millimeter thick image sections that are used for autoneuron. And so that's good. Um, and so I'm confident that we can apply our knowledge for stereologic applications as well. So stay tuned and let me know when you have some clarity um, data that you want us to look at. Okay, so I'm going to call it quits uh, for today. It is um, after our time and I want to really appreciate everybody with such a lively discussion. I know it's one-sided because I'm just reading your questions and responding to them, but um, it's been very exciting to see how many questions have come in and at the speed at which they've arrived. So if you thought that this was helpful and you'd like to have more of a free form forum like we did this time around, rather than picking a topic and discussing it in depth, please let us know and we can do this for even more topics if you would like. Um, stay tuned for our next webinar, which will be in September and I'll be discussing with my colleague Julie Korich some ways to um, take your data to the next level. So stay tuned, it should be very exciting. Thank you very much for your attention and I'll see you next time. Thanks.